LSO today. Um, and I asked them to be on the panel because I wanted to have at least one student um, on the panel to be in this conversation. So please, Justin, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Justin Rodriguez. Uh, I'm Puerto Rican American. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia, PA, and I still live there. Um, I've only been to Puerto Rico one time in my entire life, um, and that was when I was three years old. Um, I went to visit my grandfather who was passing away and he wanted to see me and my sister play on his property. Um, so I guess I'm, it's very interesting, my perspective, because I have a solely uh, American Philadelphia uh, Latino experience compared to the more diverse experiences that I guess have come before me. Yes, thank you for all those great introductions. So we're gonna start with our first question. Okay, so since it's Hispanic Heritage Month or Latinx Heritage Month, can we have a discussion around this divide that has taken shape this past decade? The government labels this month as Hispanic Heritage Month, but some argue that it should be changed to Latinx Heritage Month for more inclusivity. What do you, um, the panel, think about this divide? Anyone can start. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. Adelante, Mariana. Adelante. Justin, maybe let's de let Justin start first. Um, so I would say that um, it's very significant that people are coming out and saying that they'd rather have the Latin Heritage Month rather than the uh, Hispanic Heritage Month because it's not as Eurocentric and it's not as, um, I would say, whitewashing uh, because Hispanic. Uh, pretty much means people that descend from uh, Hispania or Spain. Um, and it kind of prioritize, prioritizes uh, the Spanish over anything else, which isn't really what uh, includes our diaspora. Um, and I especially like Latino over Latinx over Hispanic because it also includes places like uh, Brazil and Haiti um, and it doesn't exclude them. Uh, personally, I find a very, um, close relationship with a lot of uh, Haitians because we have very similar culture. It's just in a different language. Um, and I guess that's how I would end with what I was going to say. So please, uh, someone next. Um, well, what I wanted to uh, say that it's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, and I think, uh, Justin, you have brought up many important issues here. And the first issue is that um, stems from the history of, of the label Hispanic in the first place. So if we have a Hispanic Heritage Month, what does it mean to have such a label? And um, it has been uh, well recorded by now that uh, Hispanic is a term that uh, was introduced in the 1980 census. But the reason that it was introduced is because people, um, Latinos in the US uh, and actually Mexican Americans in the US uh, needed to fight for their rights and needed to get um, a basically go governmental access to many organizations and to financial support um, for specific groups. And so um, they decided, they came up with this term in Hispanic and they thought it was both. It's interesting because it, it's supposed to capture both uh, the Spanish speaking that will have a connection to Spain, but it's also supposed to be more uh, amenable in terms of it being more white. It's sounding white, the term itself. And so Hispanic becomes this umbrella terms for everybody. Um, Latinx, Latinx, on the other hand, has its specific history. It's not quite clear where it comes from. Some people think that it, it does come from, from uh, Latin American um, uh, protests where feminists were crossing out the O or the OS with an X, right? And then you get Latinx. Uh, and other people say that it's from queer groups uh, from the US, so it's not clear. I actually would have to do um, a little bit more research on it, 
but Latinx is supposed to include um, uh, people who are who don't fit the the the, the typical dichotomy, uh, the binary um, of of uh, gay, straight, uh, male, female. So it's supposed to be uh, an inclusive term. Uh, however, it does leave out it leaves out the issue of race. And so many Black Latinos, Latinos are saying this is not a, a, a term that we should be using. So whether we choose Hispan Hispanic months or Latin month, months, Heritage Month, we're going to see that there are going to be some problematic issues that come up from either choice. Maybe we can do Hispanic dash Latino, Latinx Heritage Month, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. It leaves out completely blackness, the blackness in our community. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it leaves out the indigenous. And in the boat. I mean, yes. that's huge. Yes. I, I, or, I don't want to interrupt. I'm sorry, Maria. No. Um, my my experience was that um, most of the people that I knew back in the 70s and 80s in the Northeast uh, still referred to themselves from their country of origin. So there was that identity. But in, um, and I try to remember when this was, if it was the late 70s or early 80s, that the Latino press, a newspaper was opening up in New York City. And they wanted to call it, the, the board that formed it wanted to call it Hispanic Press. And there was a huge fight over this. And in the end, they chose Latino. So there was a conscious choice there at that time. And again, I would like you, Maria, and I'd have to go back. I just remember living there and hearing that and remembering that, that argument. And um, I guess my, my question about words like all of these words, uh, except for Chicano, which is very specific in what it it um, attempts to represent, right? It's representation, not what it attempts, what it represents. And that is, how do we ever find a useful way to put into a category? What is the purpose of putting into a category people that come from extremely different and often clashing uh, identities? I mean, it, it, and what effect does that have on white America, which I also have trouble with the word Anglo because I am far from Anglo, but I get put into Anglo because of the color of my skin. And I'm not, that, that's British, right? So we cut we, these terms, I don't know what their use is. And, um, and, I, and I guess that's what we, we need to decide. I remember the first time I heard people who were knowing what the prejudice against Spanish speaking people was the first time I heard somebody from Argentina make a disparaging remark about Salvadorians. And that was the thing at the time in the eighties, everybody couldn't stand the Salvadorians because many of the Salvadorians that had come up had come from gangs. Um, and that was their, so they all got classified into that, that category. So what, what's the, the purpose of using these terms? And does the term satisfy the purpose that we select it? And that's where I get caught that I don't, I don't understand it. I, I, don't, I don't know what the, valid, the validity or the value of it is. That's my question. If, so I, I leave it with a question. Well, if I may add something, it's, um, well, when the term um, Hispanic was chosen uh, and was put in the census in 1980, it was from a decision that it was clear that we needed to name um, ourselves, that um, Latinos in the U.S. needed to uh, have a political um, identification so as to be able to get yes. um, uh, help from the government in terms of the various uh, programs that there were. It was clear that uh, Mexican Americans at the time, yes. uh, at the time the, the, what was the term? The term that was described, that described Latinos before was Spanish speaking. And there it was actually not a, 
a, a term that encompasses everybody. So there's both a, a positive um, aspect of naming, of claiming an identity, and it is that you get to have a political identity and, and to request your political rights. On the other hand, the moment that you name yourself and given the heterogeneity of, of the Latino popula population, um, this category uh, does not capture the specificity of each group. And so we, you have both a positive and a negative um, and so I think it's important to have identity and to have, and to have a political identity, but as we see, it's really hard to capture a term that will include um, both the sense of being Latino and the specificity of all the different groups, and not only just in terms of ethnicities, but in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation. And so um, I apologize. I was having problems getting online, so I'm, I'm sorry for being late. And I, th I didn't have the password yet either. So I apologize for uh, coming on. Um, I, I wonder which question are we addressing? The first one? Is yeah, we have the first one. Uh, Professor Eduardo is, is also part of our panel. Uh, uh, so yeah, we are addressing the first question um, about this divide between Hispanic um, and Latinx Heritage Month. Yeah, so I'm, let me just say a, a couple of things that may repeat what my colleagues have said. The term was first introduced in the census in 1970 under Nixon. And part of the uh, impetus was to uh, count all of those people that have Latin American background. In the 70s, because of the 1968 um, Immigration Act, um, we had a, a whole transformation, uh, ethnographic and demographic transformation of the country. And we had an incredible number of peoples of Latin American descent. Mexican Americans, the largest number. Then you had the Cubans, who had become very, you know, a huge number because of the 1959 Cuban Revolution. And then we had, of course, Puerto Ricans. So you had the, these three major ethnic groups that you couldn't keep t uh, counting as Mexican, Americans, or Cubans. So they came up with this term, Hispanic. Um, and, and it had, uh, as Mariana just pointed out, it has a very important role within the census and the demographics of the United States. Mm -hmm. If we don't get counted as peoples of some similar descent, then our voting and our access to benefits and, and, and just in general, political voice gets lost. Yeah. So it had this important role and it, it has acquired even more of an important role. Now, whether, it, whether Hispanic was the right term to use, that has been contested. It has been contested since the very beginning because people of Latin American descent understand themselves as either Cuban or Mexican or Argentinian or so on. But when they come here, they begin to uh, acknowledge that they're Latin American, that they might be Venezuelan or, or Cuban, but that together we share some common history. And so a lot of people already began the contestation back in, in, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. No, don't call us that. That's, that's those European conquerors. Mm -hmm. um, Hispaniola is, is, is doesn't refer to us. It doesn't refer to that which you want to point out. Um, so while the term, the term itself, Latin American, is a term from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and it was coined specifically um, at a time when the United States and Latin America were in conflict. It was a response to um, Anglo-American, uh, North American uh, imperial incursions into Latin America. And so people began to recognize themselves more than Cuban or Venezuelan or Colombia. They said, we are Latin America and we share a cultural heritage that puts us in tension with the Anglo world. And so the term itself, Latin American, is 
also political. And here we can talk about um, uh, Rodó's great book, Ariel. We mm -hmm. can talk about um, the whole project of um, naming um, a cultural historical experience that is sui generis Latin America in contrast to the, the United States. And of course, there was the crisis with, with um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the war against um, Cuba, um, the Cuban-American war. So th there's a, a lot of politics. Um, good, I, I, that's what I wanted to say at that question. Uh, today, because now we have um, essentially half a century of the term being banted around in the, cons in the census, um, we have come to develop what I would call a pan-Latin identity. Now we have several generations of people identified as Hispanic who say, I'm of Cuban origin, but I'm also Latin, Latino, Latina. Um, and, and people fluctuate between those. Um, so did, did, did anyone address the Latinx? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, okay. can add, you, can, you can add something to that? Yeah. Okay. Well, here's my, my take on it. I love the term. I'm actually writing a book called Latinx Philosophy, a Manifesto. And part of it is going to be to say we need to use this term, Latinx. And there are several reasons. Um, one of them is um, I think that it helps us overcome the, the, the gender dynamics of Spanish. For a very long time, we were caught between Latino, Latina, Latina, Latino. And, and that indexes it to Spanish, a language that is, is highly um, sex, not to say sexist, but sex. Yes. Um, and so it, it excludes a lot of people. There's another reason um, why Latinx is now my favorite term, because of the X. And the X is meant to signal the Nahua um, language, indigenous language. The X is the sound of Mexica or Chicana and so on, but it, it references the important role of indigenous language in the Latin interaction. Um, and, and here we can talk about uh, the great um, Dominican writer, uh, uh, who, who did a history of the Spanish language and all of the terms taken from indigenous language into Spanish that enriched Spanish. And so the X is meant to signal that reference. Um, and then third, for me, um, X reminds me of Malcolm X. Um, and so I have a kind of little ditty to the Americans, the white Americans, we're all either Jose or Maria. And, and, and we are erased in our singularity, in our very complicated plural histories. And so X, like Malcolm X, is meant to refer to that process, process of erasure that we need to overcome. So to the Anglo world, you know, we're Jose or Maria, and, and, or malos hombres. Um, and, and I think that um, that X is, you are always erasing us. You're always erasing us and we need to overcome that. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the Latin X, um, but significantly because it's, it's a term that um, allows us also to reach out to, um, you know, transgender people, um, non-heteronormative, uh, and so it, it, it creates a more capacious category, which is always a political category. Eduardo, that uh, reference of X with the Nahual and Mexica, it, is the person who first coined the term, is that what they had it, is, did they say, he or she say that? Or is that an interpretation that seeing that, oh, this could also? Because I had never, I've done some reading and I never came across that. Yeah, one person that has done this is, um, um, I have it right here, uh, Cherry Moraga. 
Um, but um, I also- but when, when, when did she say this? Because Mariana mentioned how the feminists in Latin America, we, the feminists decided that the X was needed because in Latinos, we're all left out. Okay, because yeah. that's a masculine term, and that's back in the seventies. So there, there was that visualization of the X. So I'm just curious. So Cherry Moraga began to use the Chicana term. Um, uh, I seventies I, as well. No, no, I mean specifically the Latinx term. When oh. whoever coined Latinx and began and began to put that out there. I'm curious, did they say, because the things I've read have to do with inclusivity. It has to do to fight the police and political uh, oppression uh, to leave that out and include all the groups. I mean, there, I've read a lot of different things, but I never came across that the person who put it there. I mean, I think it's a great interpretation, but I don't, I, I'm curious, was that one of the original intentions of putting the X there? Um, well, I don't know who coined the term. Um, I don't have the, the specific uh, date. It is from the 2000s. It begins to appear and there are multiple reasons why it, okay. it began. And, but, yeah. but we have in the background, the Chicano Chicana. No, I know that. I, yeah, I was just curious about that specific term. But Cherry Maraga makes it very explicit in her work. And oh. it, that could have influence later generations? Um, I actually, uh, I, I see the genealogy in a very different way. I think okay. I agree that it could be a really um, interesting interpretation. And yes, indeed, Cherry Muraga um, does the X as Chi, um, but the term Latin X is very, very specific to um, queer groups. Uh, in the US, so the genealogy is contested. Uh, the terms first started appearing. Um, it was also an internet phenomenon. Uh, and so we get the appearance, a lot of people put it specifically in 2004. Um, and the purpose of the X um, was supposed to be the noting in order that for the X to um, get rid of the dichotomy of male, female, gay, straight. So the term itself is um, taken up by people who really want to contest the patriarchy uh, in Latino culture. And so that's the specific claim of, of the term. And so uh, it gets taken up so that people who are queer, who are uh, gender non-conforming, who don't agree with a binary, uh, yeah. which is completely uh, endorsed, um, according to some, by not just the, the grammar of, of Spanish, but also by our communities, mm -hmm. uh, so that we can displace that kind of thinking. And so the primary purpose of Latinx was in terms of this um, uh, sort of a revolutionary move um, in order to problematize um, this uh, Latino um, claim that there's a binary male, female, gay, straight. And so that's the primary. And, and then I think adding that interpretation about the X is, is um, I think it's very important, um, but the origins of the term, there are various genealogies to it, but one main thing that we know is that it's definitely about um, queering the term Latino. Yeah. Um, as a language instructor, um, which is what I concentrate on. That's a, a, a very interesting thing when I'm teaching the language. I have always told them, and as of right now, things have, I'm sure things are going to change. But originally, when we say Latino, or uh, if we use the masculine plural form, we're including everybody. So that's male, females, LGBTQ, even your animals. As long as you use the masculine form, you're including 
everybody. But I understand the idea of changing and being maybe being a little bit more specific. But I have a question for Professor Mendieta. Um, hi, I'm Rosa Chisholm and I teach Spanish in Abington about your book. Um, are you going to include, or are you talking about people from Brazil? Because we were talking a little bit about that before, or from, um, I guess, Portuguese is in Portugal, but Brazil is in, in so how, how are you handling that? If, if, if that? if that is part of your, your book? Well, <laughs> um, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, um, the genesis, as Mariana points out, of the term Latinx may lie with people who want to um, destabilize the gender dynamics of Spanish um, in order to make it more inclusive. However, I'm developing a, a more expansive genealogy of the term, and I point that out three lines, um, one having to do with contesting, uh, juxtaposing the Latino to Anglo-Saxon, which is already in itself a, a very important. The, the other one is um, the reference that um, you can find in Pedro Enrique Ureña, the great historian of Latin American culture and language in particular, and the richness of Spanish that comes from this um, semiotic linguistic appropriation. Um, and, and there's a whole, terms that Aguacate, for instance. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's tons and tons of, of words that are not Latin, and they're not Spanish, that are part of Latin American Spanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in that. And the way we index that is with the X, which is the sound of Mexico, Mexico. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I like that. Uh, I find Mexico. that really persuasive and powerful. Mm -hmm. Right you now. Uh, correct. Um, and, and then the X of Malcolm X. Um, and I think we need to create that link because we have a lot of Afro-Latinos, Afro-Latin X peoples. And, and that gets lost um, when we think of ourselves as merely descendants of um, the Spanish people. We're also descendants of, of slaves. Yeah. And that then that raises the important point that you bring up which is, I think Brazil is part of the Latino experience, in particular, because it, it includes the long history of slavery in, in Brazil. Um, so in my work, I'm gonna, I make reference to Brazilians. Okay. Uh, and Brazilian thinkers and Brazilian writers who have been part of the intellectual world. And in particular, in my case, the philosophical world. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you. No, I, I would the, include them. Do the students have any questions? We, I, we don't want to take over the whole. <laughs> the students that are here, it, do you have any questions? Is there anything you would like to talk about? Please jump in if you have something to say. Yes, we, we don't want to take over because if, if you leave <laughs> us alone, then we're going to be talking here until 5 p.m. <laughs> we're never going to give you a chance. So you have to ask questions and let us know what you think or how you feel. Uh, I had a quick, I had a, like a quick, um, how I feel about the map. Is uh, for me, I come from um, my father is from uh, Mexico and my mother's from Spain. So I identify as Latino and Hispanic, just because. Um, so I can kind of understand the coin, and if I had to choose to coin a term, I choose Latina X, because Latino X, sorry, <laughs> because. Is more inclusive because me coming from a person part of the LGBT community, I feel like it makes me more welcome, and I feel like Hispanic is like what you said more whitewashing because I feel like Americans prefer Hispanic more than Latino or Latina. Yeah. And um, and someone from the LGBT community, Latina X really does make us feel a part of the community because some of our families still have conservative views and don't see as LGBT as part of the community. And for me, it really does coin a term because it makes us seem that we're all unified and not diverse or from apart from each other. So personally, I find Latina X a, a suited name compared to Hispanic. Great. Perfect. Thank you. 
I would, I wanted to, um, I appreciate your response, Mariana, about um, the reason for the political uh, identification. And I totally agree with that. Um, that. I was thinking, what I've been thinking about is, um, especially recently, is organizing and resistance. And one of the things that troubles me is, uh, I mean, I, I have very vivid memories in the different communities that I've lived in different part of, parts of the US of the division amongst groups um, that somehow lumping them, we, we have that tendency to put them together like there's the Latino vote. And I know African-Americans feel the same way, there's the black vote. And to create a political identity like that, for me, I, I wish there were, um, it, it serves to us, uh, it, it has its place. And, and I think, um, who just spoke, I'm sorry, was, did he go away, Abel? Was oh, that, yes. Yes, Abel. Abel, yeah. Abel, Abel, what you just said is so important because I think that kind of identity, identification is part of the power of it from a policy point of view and from looking at how Latinos are perceived in Latinx people are perceived in the US, I still am flabbergasted as how there's one image that, that goes out uh, or, or that people are lumped in. And, and yet in Latin America, I guess maybe that's why I wonder if Latin American is a, um, it serves in certain ways because you're just pointing out the geographic location. Latino sounds like a shared ethnicity and I don't see a shared ethnicity. I, I see a shared historical experience. And, and, and so the terms work there. I mean, we're just having kind of a theoretical uh, conversation here. And when we're organizing I, um, in grassroots, um, I, I just wonder, I, I think it's been very useful because Abel points it out that you become, you feel, um, you feel a, a part of it. But then I think of Marco Rubio and uh, all that he stands for and realize that how do we encompass this and do we perpetuate some myth that all Latinos or Latinx people or Latin Americans, people from the, as somebody, uh, I think Justin used the word diaspora, um, and it's not a diaspora if you're Puerto Rican, I mean, you're kind of stuck with it. We, you were not uh, given the opportunity to be separate, but, um, that's that's kind of what I've been trying to mull over in my brain. It's I don't have any fix. I, I just a fixed idea other than what are the good parts of it, what are the useful parts of it, and where are the parts of it that uh, we should be aware of, and how does it, how does that all play out in the politics and policies um, in our present day situation in the U.S. Anyway, um, I think that that that's precisely the problem that a pan-ethnic group does not really capture our specificity and yet we need it for political purposes. And so, um, and I take it, Eduardo, that's the reason why you're also looking for a, a term that's capacious enough to not only include issues of, of, um, of gender issues, but also in terms of the histories that we have from Latin America and also the, the taking up of Latin uh, of uh, indigenous um, culture within Chicanos in the U.S. and so so that's like uh, broadening the group. But in terms of political activism, I think it just has to be clear that what you have in a coalition it depends on what the idea of coalition is. If you want the coalition to have people that have one shared history, even within Latino Americanos, we don't have a shared history. Well, well, yeah, we have the conquest, but that specific histories within col col colonization. And so um, I think that we have to be able to learn that being political, being in a coalition does not mean that we have the same histories, but we have the same aims, political aims. Um, because we will not find a term. Uh, if we start splintering, it's hard to get the political impetus. But then if you over uh, take, if you take just the, 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 the pan-ethnic term, you won't feel satisfied because you quite, you don't 
connect to this guy who calls himself, you know, Marco Rubio. What? I have nothing to do with him, right? So I think it depends on how we set up the issue of coalition. In my mind right now, one of the biggest um, issues that we need to deal with as Lati, Latinx people um, is precisely um, Black lives. Black lives in the U.S., Black lives, Latinos in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and it is Latinos who are telling us that they don't like the Latinx uh, oh, term. Yeah. And I think that this is very important. Um, I think, I, you know, very few people who are not academics use the term Latinx. And so that's one of the reasons why people don't like it. Um, they think that it's an imposition, a class issue, right? In terms of the educated imposing it on people, that's one critique. But the, the latest critique is coming from black Latinos. And I think that's an important critique. And I, I have to say, you know, I'm very happy with the capaciousness of the term uh, Latinx in terms of uh, queerness. I'm a queer, um, uh, La Latina, and so I really appreciate having the X in terms of issues of gender and being non-binary, especially, right? Um, and yet, I have been reading the latest debates about uh, Latinx not being inclusive of Blackness, and I worry oh. about that. That, so that, that, that. That's a good thing, a good point. Uh, let me, yeah. let me just, yeah. I'm sorry. Mariana, that, that's exactly, that's part of my uh, chapter one of my book. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me um, point out here for uh, colleagues, Henry Louis Gates um, Jr., you know, the great um, African-American scholar, wrote a beautiful book which uh, has inspired me and is in the background of my own engagement with ethnic labels. And the book in, my, in question is, color people. Um, and that book begins with the story of how African Americans across history have called themselves different things. Color, Negro, Black, African American. And he says, they all have a history. Um, they all are indexed to very specific political uh, projects. And so he settles, he says that the most important for us today is African-American. We're of African descent, but we are simultaneously American and we need to claim both. And that's why the term shifted from black and um, Negro to African-American. By the same token, I want to argue precisely because of ma what Mariana said, that we need to have a term X because that creates, in my view, and in my argumentation, a bridge to um, our African-American colleagues. It's, it's claiming the history of slavery, of blackness, of the middle passage, of the black Atlantic that impacts so much the Caribbean and, <laughs> and Latin America. I mean, the, the, the middle passage was a middle passage through Latin America to the United States. Um, so when we think about uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, that was a Latin, a Latin American city. And it was a port for the importation of slaves. Um, so um, that is an argument that I'm working on and, and I'm making um, precisely because of, of what Mariana's pointing out. Um, so, I right now, to, they, I cannot wait to read your book. <laughs> but but um, the point here is the reference to Henry Louis Gates, who has given us a genealogy, a history of the ways in which blacks have denominated themselves, depending on what was the political project. And and to today, Latinx people have to take up the mantle, the banner of the civil rights movement that began in the 50s with Latinos, uh, La um, African-Americans, of which um, Latinos were part. Cesar Chavez was part of that movement. Mm -hmm. and, and X in Latin 
is reclaiming to that, that history. But I may add though that we have black Latinos saying that they don't like the term. And so it's one thing to have a theoretical account. Do you see? I think that it's impro important for people to name themselves. Um, and I think that we can theoretically, um, as a queer woman, as a queer Latina, I like Latinx, but I have become concerned insofar as it is Black people in our own communities who feel that the term excludes them. And right. so I think that we have to look into that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't use Latinx. I actually, um, yeah. I myself prefer the term Latino in Latina. Uh, and so when I write, I put Latina, Latino, and slash X. I add all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can understand uh, why um, Black Latinos are not happy with the term. And so it's almost at this point, we have the, the, the problem. At first, we have the issue of pan ethnicity versus specificity. And now we have a different issue, which is social identity. Which social identity is going to be the primary identity informing the term? In Latinx, it seems to be gender and not race. And so now people are saying, well, it seems that gender is trumping race. Why shouldn't we be aware of race first? And that's why other terms have been created now to um, highlight African, African um, uh, ancestry and indigenous ancestry within people of color. And yeah. so that's the, uh, we have a big uh, question in our hands, I think. If uh, Black Latinos uh, reject the term, uh, if the majority of them reject the term, what, what should we do? Um, I think that's, um, that's quite important because I also think it's very important for groups to name themselves. We cannot, I as a, a light-skinned Latina cannot name um, uh, Black Latinos. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. Just the fact that it could be very inclusive, a, cap a capacious uh, term. Um, and so I suggest that that's the next step to think about that you know, through issue. Eduardo, that's another chapter in your book. Yes, right? we're, at, we're okay. adding chapters. Yeah. Okay, um, there, there's a fourth element. Um, I'm sorry to, to keep uh, adding, but there's a fourth reason why I think it is a more cosmopolitan, more ecumenical term to use uh, Mariana's term, capacious. And that is, I have heard this, that there are a lot of Latinos, Latinas who don't have Spanish as their mother tongue. They are second, third generation, well, many generations, um, Latinos, Latinas, who, who are alienated by the Latino, Latino, Latina, because they, they, that's Spanish. And, and all they have is English. And so some people, um, I don't know if Abel thinks this, some people think that that is kind of saying, well, you're not Latino because you don't know Spanish. And I think that the, the, I have heard this argument and I also find it quite pers um, persuasive. Um, anyway. Uh, I, love, I love what Oscar just put on, on the chat. Yeah, so I just um, put in the chat, is there any space for the term Afro-Latinx? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is a term that I've seen a lot in like social media um, and like in books I'll be reading uh, from Dominican uh, Afro-Latinx writers, they, they take ownership of Latin, uh, Afro-Latinx um, because they do, as Professor Mariana said, uh, feel that the term, the sole term Latinx thus erases their blackness or their roots. Um, I also wanna say that um, the term Hispanic, a lot of people have um, problem with the term Hispanic as I've read um, because it erases our, some of our Latin American countries, they, they speak indigenous language. So like they feel like the term Hispanic is erasing their indigenous language and roots. And that's why the term, they take in ownership of like, like that Latino term instead of the H Hispanic, which leads them to like associated to Spain and only the Spanish language, mm -hmm. um, which I find interesting as well. 
So, so Mariana, is that, a, a, and that's kind of what I was thinking about, how do we overcome without splintering? You're right about the splintering. So does adding a, pre, a, a word, a prefix there, using or, or inclus, including Afro, do you, how do you, how do you um, see that, that um, in the long run of attempting to create the uh, political grouping that we, that is to, to benefit by having the nomenclature Latinx? Yes, that now there are, the, from what I've read lately, people are using Black Latinx, Latinx, Black Latinx, and Afro Latinx. Uh, but some people have come up and said that that term neg negates, and if not, if it's not negates, it covers up the, the indigeneity uh, yeah. issue. It's, yeah. The debate continues, uh, and um, people in um, Spanish speakers feel very uncomfortable with the X, mm -hmm. uh, and so they're using the E. Latine, right, to denote um, the gender issue, and instead of an X, an E, an E. <laughs> you know, it's almost as if the X has been supplanted by an A. <laughs> and so, do you see? And so, this is the problem. So, you you try to highlight one specific um, group or identity or social identity, then another one gets um, negated. And so uh, I'm not sure. I think this is a developing story. Um, it is. It and we to hear more about how people, what's comfortable. I know that in um, at University Park, uh, we were working on the uh, Latina Latino Studies program, and uh, the director decided not to use Latinx. And it was because there was um, a um, I guess students were asked and so few identified with the term. I like Latinx and I wanted the program to be Latinx studies. And yet the, pro the program is supposed to serve students and our population and our population did not care about the term. And so it's complicated, uh, yeah. It's funny you mentioned that, Mariana, because I was just on the website and I was kind of, I don't want to say horrified, but taken aback by the image that's used there. And it's an image that is, in my estimation, both sexist and, I don't know, it, it is an image of Mexicans um, standing around and uh, the, of, of a big picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe. It's a drawing. Mm -hmm. And men are holding like working items and holding the Virgin in the background, there's only like two women that are kind of visual that you can see. And one of them has her hand on the shoulder, standing behind the man in front of her with her hand on the shoulder and the other woman's holding a baby. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really, um, was surprising to me because as much as the words are important, so are the images. And, um, and we're still just working on that. I, I wanted to mention one quick thing. Monday night, uh, at six, Monday afternoon at six, University of Texas at Austin is doing a panel of some very well-known speakers. Um, and I can send Oscar the, um, I mean, I don't know how to get, the, I, I only have a kind of a poor image here and I don't know how to upload oh. an image unless you let me share screen it. Oh, Send it to me. I'll I'll send it. Um, okay, yeah. because it's Monday, and I just heard about it yesterday when I was talking to a linguistic uh, linguist there. Friends who are from Penn State actually original were here, uh, Jacqueline Terribio, and they've got these scholars working on what's it's called what's in a name Latinx. So that may be of interest to those of you that are interested. <laughs> yes, and I think this is a great place to end because. Uh, we the event was supposed to end at one, but I want to thank all of you professors for coming to this event and for participating. Uh, I think this was a great discussion. I, I'm just like impressed, and I was just sitting back and like taking all the information in. I definitely learned a lot, and I hope um, our students who joined us today learned a lot as well. I learned a lot too. Yes. <laughs> thank thank you. you, Oscar, for the invite. Thank you. And thank you, all you students, for coming.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Bye.